That was a great song. I really like that. That was the way they harmonized. It was beautiful. And if you're listening to the words, you just got another sermonette stuck in there as well because it was, uh, it was about the meaning of this day. <clears throat> also, I just thought I'd comment about the, the flowers and there is a um, shofar down there uh, right in front of the podium here. That's a neat touch for uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Well, this day, of course, looks forward to the day as the song just song said. We look forward to the sound of the trumpet, Jesus Christ returning to this earth, and the resurrection of the saints. The resurrection of those who lived throughout the 6,000 years, that they would be resurrected. And I was just thinking, I don't think we've seen a miracle on this earth since the creation of the earth itself that is that big people dead for 6,000 years and they're going to be resurrected this is amazing it's an amazing thing that we're looking forward to and there's another amazing thing that we're looking forward to and I'm thinking we should all be very excited about and that is our marriage to Jesus Christ nothing is stronger than a bond between a husband and wife and this we will be the bride of Christ. Um, let's go back to Revelation 19. There isn't much said about this marriage, but Revelation 19 and verses seven and uh, verse seven is what we're going to go look at first. It talks about that marriage that that is going to happen, uh, and and there's joy in this marriage. Revelation 19 and verse seven. Let us be glad and rejoice. The attitude of joy is here. Be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. Think about that. It says his wife has made herself ready. My question to you. Are you ready? Are we ready? Um, it's not only to be a wife, <laughs> it's to do a job after Christ comes. We are to be a royal priesthood in the future, to teach other people. We are to be teachers. We're supposed to help people coming up to Jerusalem to learn God's way of life, to explain the questions that they have, Do you and I understand every difficult scripture in the Bible? Uh, so many of the scriptures of Paul, you have to read and reread and, and go back to see uh, what, what law is being talked about here. Can, can you do that? I can't do everything so good. And every once in a while, I run across something in the Bible that I say, wow, I, I don't get it. I'll look up concordances, and sometimes I never, I just don't get it. We have beliefs, we have churches of God of different denominations, and for the most part, the core is all the same, but there's little differences, idiosyncrasies uh, that are out there, and we think a little different, and we may have some different point of view than our own church that we belong to, and that's okay. But you know, when we're going to be teachers, we all have to say the same thing. We have to say, what God believes and Jesus Christ believes and they are it, it's it's just part of being truthful we can't have people talking about things in four different realms <laughs> it just can't be done the title of the message getting ready to be Christ's bride we need to be getting ready to be Christ's bride we're going to stay basically in the book of Revelation today. Uh, it's, it's so much the Feast of Trumpets. <laughs> it is the Feast of Trumpets. It's, you want to focus on the Feast of Trumpets? Here in Revelation is where it's at. Let's go back to Revelation 12 and starting in verse 7. Revelation 12 and starting in verse 7. 
a big event happens, and it's a turning point. It's a big turning point at the end of this age. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, which is Satan. And the dragon, Satan, and his angels, which are called demons, they fought. But they did not prevail. The demons and Satan did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels, or demons, were cast out with him. Satan knows this day is coming. He knows better than we do the future. He knows this day is coming. This Satan has really dominated in this world dynamically through 6,000 years. Uh, very few have been called by God and been loyal to God throughout this whole time period. Really, it's just so minute. Satan has had his way, and it's not because God is weak that God chose it that way. He's going to choose the few. So, verse 10, we see how the angels look at this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. It's one of, one, one of, of Satan's big jobs was accused the brethren to, to get people uh, to not make it into God's kingdom. The very few <laughs> that have been chosen, Satan still wants them down. And it says at the beginning of it, angels rejoice because this day when Satan is cast down, the angels look at this as a great day because God the Father and Jesus Christ are now going to start to intervene and to put things together for the return of Jesus Christ and the setup of the, the millennium. It's just, it's just a matter of time now. Verse 11, and they overcame him, the people who have been faithful throughout the years, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, they had their sins forgiven, and they could make it into God's kingdom. And by the word of their testimony, as they were true to God and obedient to him, and they did not love their lives to the death. Many throughout this, throughout this last 2,000 years, you can, you can find periods of time where Christians were killed. And yet, they won in being killed because they gave up physical life for eternal life. And there are going to be those at this last end of this age that are going to have to do the same thing. It's going to be brutal. But physical life versus eternity with God. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, verse 12. Therefore, angels, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. It's a great day for the angels because they can see this is the time where Satan starts that intervention. I mean, Christ and God the Father start this intervention. Satan is going to be put down very shortly, but not yet. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because there's trouble coming. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Satan knows we're close to the end, and he knows exactly how close we are to the end. And he is going to work to make things work out for him. He knows the Bible, he knows what the Bible says that he's going to be cast in the bottomless pit, but he isn't giving up, and I don't think he really believes it. I think he thinks he still has a chance. 
because he's going to battle as strongly as possible in the last three and a half years of the end of this age. What's Satan's goal? First of all, he knows Christ is going to return to this earth to set up that government. He wants to get the world to see Christ as maybe an antichrist, the enemy. Christ is going to be the enemy. If he can portray Christ as the enemy, he brings all the armies of the world together Maybe they're thinking they're going to battle against each other, but they're going to battle against Christ. This huge last bloodbath that's on the earth. And, and Satan is going to try to drum up this thing in such a way that it looks like the people ruling on the earth at that time are really going to be the saviors. You're going to have to fight this person coming down out of heaven. And the second thing he wants, the few people that are out there that are obeying God, he wants to destroy them. He wants to destroy those who are loyal to him, or even better, to deceive them to actually thinking that a power that's on earth is really uh, better than God's, that they would follow this, this person on earth. Through it all, Satan, he knows what he's doing. He's got a plan. He's going to find someone, and it's going to be a leader of a re resurrection, a seventh resurrection of the Roman Empire. And this resurrection of the Roman Empire, this leader, Satan, the book of Revelation, it calls him the beast. And as far as the Roman Empire at that time, it'll be made up of just 10 nations, where we have 27 now. But those 10 kings will give their power to the beast. Satan will be the influence of that beast. And it's a direction to start moving the whole world away from God, to blaspheme God. Let's look at Revelation 13 and verses 3 through 4. Um, first of all, I'm just going to, the very end of verse 2. And the dragon, Satan, gave him, the beast, this, this person, and the Roman Empire, the dragon gave his power, his throne, uh, gave him, the, the beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. Satan puts him in place. He's going to use him. He's going to manipulate to make things work for the best that he can through this person. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. You know, you look at Europe and you, you, I think we all think, well, it's going to rise. It will rise, but it's going to come down first. <laughs> as it says here, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. It will come back through the power of Satan and the inspiration that he puts into this person called the beast. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. They, the world can't, won't be able to believe the resurrection of this Roman Empire that they just see before their very eyes. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast not just acknowledging how great he is, they're going to worship him. This, this is great. He could be a messiah, if you will. Who is like the beast, they say? Who is able to make war with him? What a powerhouse. We know this Roman Empire is going to be an economic power, a major economic power. And, in, and, and the world, you know, we all lust after things. <laughs> As Mr. Apartian just talked about, it can be our God. And the world's gods are the things of it. And when someone can bring back wealth, not only to the Roman Empire, but to the whole world, that's somebody to really be happy about. And they will be. 
We won't turn back to Matthew 24, but Matthew 24, of course, talks about uh, Christ is asked, uh, what are the signs of the end of the age? In Matthew 24, 24, Christ told the disciples there will be false Christs. False Christs. They really think this is Christ coming down, and, and yet it won't be. And false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. How, how good will he be able to do it? So, as, so if possible, they would even be able to deceive the very elect. If possible, they would actually be able to deceive the very elect. That's, that's good. I mean, Satan, Satan does a great job here. He makes things so real that they think, wow, this beast, this power, is, he's our savior. He's our Messiah, an economic Messiah, you might say. Verse 5. And he was given, the beast was given, a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. He's going to blaspheme God. But the people are going to accept that blasphemy because they're going to say, wow, you know, maybe this guy's right. And look at what he's able to do. He's a powerhouse. He's going to be able to do great things because of Satan. And he's going to blaspheme uh, 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 God. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. I want you to remember that. So that's three and a half years. Three and a half years in Revelation pops up every little bit. It's nice. It, it, three and a half years. Mark it. The beast starts. Satan influences him at three and a half years before the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 8. And all, and I underline that word all, because it just seems impossible. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, the whole world will worship the beast, except those whose names are written in the book of life. God's people, as they've been baptized, as they have the Holy Spirit, their names are written in the book of life. Those are the only ones that do not worship the beast. That's, that's amazing to me. I can't imagine how somebody could do that. But that's the power of Satan and his influence at the end of this age and his direction. So, we see that. Well, what are God's goals? God has goals here too. And it starts, you could say things start over again at the, at the beginning of this three and a half year period before the return of Christ. God's goal is to get the bride ready. We just talked about that at the beginning. God needs to get his bride ready so that Christ will marry a bride who is ready to be the wife, the supporting char character to make the millennium work and to start getting the word out to the whole world in the millennium. The fact is, God's people, God's churches around the world and there are, there are, God's people are around the world. There are the strong ones. There are the weak ones. There are the, the babes in Christ. And Mr. Eckham had just had a sermon on this about two, three weeks ago. Talked about the babes in Christ, those that are just new. There are some that are strong. There are some that are weak. And honestly, they need different paths to make it into God's kingdom. Some, at this, if, if Christ would return right at that point, uh, wouldn't be in God's kingdom. But God will work with them to help some to be there that otherwise wouldn't. Revelation 12, verse 13 and 14, or yes, we'll first start off with verses 13 and 14. We see Satan going after what is called the woman. And the woman in, in Bible prophecy is the church. 
they're sometimes the harlot, which is the false church, and this is the true church. Verse 13, now when the dragon, Satan, saw that he had been cast to the earth, as we read in verse 12, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. God will provide this place. It is God's protection. The woman will fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Three and a half years. The beast is three and a half years. The woman goes to her place in the wilderness for three and a half years. All laid out here. <laughs> you could say, it, it might be at the very exact day because there's one that talks about 1260 days. It's amazing how this plays out and how things are turning at this very moment. And the woman will go to her place in the wilderness and she will be nourished. There is, God will provide for this woman. We won't turn back to Isaiah 33, verse 16. You might just write it down and look at it later. It says, of this place, bread will be given him, the church. Bread will be given him. Water will be sure. God will provide the bread. God will provide the water. It probably isn't going to be there any other way if God doesn't deliver it. Um, and yet, the woman has to have faith. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Apartian talked about faith. Tell you what, there are those that won't go. They won't have the faith. And you could understand if it's human reasoning, you wouldn't go, we shouldn't go. But it's God who is going to make the path. It is God who will protect them for three and a half years. There is no place better on the earth to be than in the wilderness in her place. So we see verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Satan knows exactly what's going on here. And it says he's going to spew water out of his mouth like a flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. It could be like an earthquake that the earth opens up. We look at this word flood. It may very well be water, uh, a flood of water that goes out. Uh, you know, there's so much. I think it, it's good to dream. It's good to dream. It's good to look at things as they're laid out here and, and to kind of don't feel bad if you didn't get things right when you speculated, but at least broaden your mind of what's the possibilities out here. This flood, sometimes a flood is an army. The fact that Satan influences the beast on the very day that the woman goes to her place of safety, will Satan inspire the beast to take his army and to go after to destroy the woman? And the earth opens up and swallows it up? You know what I think about? I think about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. They go across the Red Sea. The army comes through there and is going to get them. And the waters come back on top of the army and totally destroy them. And their Israelites are safe, truly safe. <laughs> Until that moment, they aren't safe. And when that earth opens up, whether it's water or an army, this is a miracle from God, a mighty miracle from God. And those people are going to feel just like the Israelites did when they came out of Egypt. <laughs> We're safe. We're safe. And they've got to believe. They've got to have faith that God will provide because it, well, they won't live too long without, the, without God intervening in their lives. But he will. 
So, we see that. What a mighty miracle this is. Is there anything that kind of shows us this same concept that God will protect his people? Let's go back to Revelation 3, because in Revelation 3, you've got the different churches. They are, they are different characteristics that, are, that the people that live, at, 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 at maybe even all these characteristics of churches now, but they also have a sequence. And the Philadelphia church, God's church, it's a faithful church to God, Revelation 3 and verse 10. We see the reward to the Philadelphia church. Because you have kept my command to persevere, you've been faithful, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from the hour of trial. There is going to be a great tribulation. God, Satan is going after the, 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 the church, but I will protect you from this hour of trial in the wilderness to the place that he provides for his people. He will protect, it says, the reward for the Philadelphia church. What a great thing. I say we need to, we need to sit back sometimes and, and kind of look what isn't there. It doesn't say what's going to happen for three and a half years. Three and a half years, if, if, if you're just had nothing to do, I mean, I, what are you going to do? do you, make sure you bring your deck of cards. We got lots of time to play cards, right? <laughs> what's God going to do with those people for three and a half years? And this is just, you know, let's sit back and speculate. He's got to get a bride ready. We don't all think the same. We need to be ready to marry Jesus Christ. And we need somebody to say, hey, you think this way, you're wrong. This is where it is. Moses was given to the children of Israel, and God spoke to Moses and taught the people, and they knew the truth of what they needed to know. Will God provide somebody within the group that goes there? And, and will he be a person to direct them in, in exactly what all the scriptures that we don't understand, what they truly say? Will it be an angel? We just talked about Michael fighting. Will Michael come down? He's been there with God. He might know. He might know. He might be able to come down, and, and we would certainly respect this person, wouldn't we? An angel? I think about Jesus Christ, to tell you the truth, because Jesus Christ spent three and a half years with his disciples to teach them to get them ready for the New Testament church. And, and seven is the number of perfection, and I think, what if it was Jesus Christ to come down, teach his people for three and a half years to get them ready to be on the same page, to get it all together. That would be amazing. I can't say <laughs> the way it's going to go. And I'm not saying anything about the way it's going to go. All I'm saying is, let's sit back and wait. And when it happens, it happens. And you know what? It will be the best way. It will be the best. And at the end of that three and a half years, the bride will have made herself ready. But it's going to take, uh, you go to college to become a, a, a profession, it takes a four-year degree probably. Three and a half years sounds like a good college education that we just may very well be entitled in for as, as we go down the line. That's exciting, really, because you need the training if you're going to teach other people and to be able to disseminate to everyone truth you don't want to mess up. None of us want to mess up when we get in that position because there's a lot on, going to be on our shoulders as the bride of Christ. There is. So, it's a wonderful time. Uh, and, and, and to just kind of sit back and speculate about this is a good thing. Revelation 12, we just ended Revelation 12, verse 16. The earth swallows up the flood or it could be the army. But verse 17 says, 
And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They're part of the church. They keep the commandments of God. They may not have had the faith to go where the woman was told to go, but they are God's people. Uh, they do keep the commandments, and they do have the testimony of Jesus Christ, but they didn't go. They didn't go. And there is, God's going to make this dis distinction, and it's going to be for the best. Those who go to the place of safety, those who do not go, because they need something. They need to go through a different, a different path. One goes one way, one goes the other, but they all end up married to Jesus Christ. But they have to go a different way because of the, of the character of the people. Let's go back to Revelation 3 again, where we just saw the reward to the Philadelphia church. What does it say about the Laodiceans? I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, you know, something cold to drink, something hot to drink, they're both good. But something lukewarm, ooh. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. This is Jesus Christ speaking here, uh, for God the Father. <laughs> but he's saying, you aren't going to make it being lukewarm. You can't be, you know, kind of in the middle of the road. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know, you're in trouble. To stay here like you are, you're not going to make it. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich. Not physically rich, spiritually rich. And white garments as the bride of Christ is in a white linen. White garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. You've got to get, you've got to, you've got to be healed from where you're at. You are sick and you don't even know it. And he says, buy for me gold refined in fire. If they turn around, they can be as precious as gold. What could be more precious physically than gold? But they can be gold. But it had gonna have to be refined by fire. Fire is the symbol for tribulation, for tough times. And sometimes people that are lackadaisical, the best thing can happen to them is to have to stand up. I mean, either you sink or swim. There is no middle. To sitting there at lukewarm, just paddling in the water, you're going to sink. You've got to sink or swim. And this is sink or swim time for these people. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous. Zealous is the opposite of being lukewarm. Therefore, be zealous and repent. In other words, to stay lukewarm, you're not going to make it, but you need to repent. You need to change and, and, and realize you're, you need God's help. And it does have to all be through God's help. Um, so how does it go? Satan's here, at, at we saw in, in chapter 12, it says he has great wrath. He goes after the rest of the offspring. How does it go? We'll turn back to Daniel. The only time I'm going to be out of Revelation, but we're going to turn to Daniel. We could go at many places in Revelation that kind of show the same thing of the persecution that will come. Revelation, I mean, uh, Daniel 7 and verse 25. This is speaking of the beast, the one who is controlled by Satan. He, the beast, shall speak pompous words against the Most High. His words are against God and against Jesus Christ because he wants, he wants to get people to turn against God. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, God's remnant, 
those offspring uh, that are left, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand. God has really protected his people through these 2,000 years of persecution and let some die along the way, but God's going to have an awful lot of hands off here. Then the saints shall be given into his hand. God will let it happen. How long? You want to take a guess? For a time, times, and half a time. Three and a half years. The day the woman goes into her place, the day that, that the beast is controlled by Satan, is the day that the remnant is going to go into a time of persecution. What a day. This is an amazing day. <laughs> Not necessarily a happy day, but it's an amazing day. Yes, it is. So uh, I know some of, the, some of the German calendars as we've gone to Germany, many of the German calendars, if you look, you pick up a German calendar, you will find they will have the seventh day of the week, Sunday. It's, it's the weekend. And, and they, 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 they can justify that, putting Sunday there. And yet it looks like it's the seventh day of the week. And, and, and it says here that he will change times and law. I, I don't know that that is necessarily going to happen that way, but it is kind of interesting that the calendars in Germany uh, mostly have Sunday as the last day of the week. It's a very subtle thing, and basically people will go along with it and will not. I don't think we'll have a problem with all of the changes that the beast makes because they will worship him, so they apparently like it. And to most people, it doesn't make any difference. But to us, it makes a big difference. It's the difference between sin and not sin. So we will see how it goes. <laughs> but God's people will know and recognize um, where, where there is sin and where there is disobedience to God and where there is not. Okay. Will the Laodiceans qualify? God says, you've got, to, you've got to buy from me gold refined in fire. Will they make it? Um, and then to be rich, to be spiritually rich and have these white garments. There's a promise of white garments. And being in these white garments for the return of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to Revelation again. Revelation 7. Revelation 7 talks about the sealing of the 144,000. And from 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. And after the sealing of the 144,000, which we've all heard, I know, you go down to verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. What are they clothed in? Clothed with white robes. They got white robes on them. These are people who have been faithful to God. They have white robes on. With palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God. They are looking forward to the return of Christ. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There is God the Father who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Both are there as they both are involved in, in what comes down the line here at the end of this age. Verse 13, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robe? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They go through the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, accepting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And they have white robes on. They've made it. This is, a, this is they are a part of, those who will be marrying Jesus Christ. And we see their reward in the next verse. 
Therefore they, therefore, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits with, on the throne and will dwell among them. They are going to be there with Jesus Christ and God the Father in that throne room. That's an amazing reward. How about the Laodiceans? Revelation 3, verse 21. The reward to the Laodiceans who are obedient. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Wow. That's basically the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> they will make it. They are going to be there at the very throne with God the Father and Jesus Christ. I would call that gold, to tell you the truth. That's gold, isn't it? <laughs> but they had to be refined by fire. And they did. And they were willing to die, and many will die. So, are they ready? Are they, can they teach other people? They've gone through tribulation. You got to say they had faith, and they really showed their faith, didn't they? Let's go back to Revelation 7, where we just came from, and we read through verse 15. Uh, they will sit and rule with Christ on his throne. Verse 17. I think this is really important. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them. A shepherd has to take his sheep and, and take them where they need to go for their own good. Jesus Christ, the Lamb, who is in the midst of them, will shepherd them, and he will lead them to living waters, living fountains of waters. He will lead them. You know what? I think they may have a college course coming. <laughs> I don't know, but I think they may have a college course coming. So they can be ready when Christ is ready to set up the millennium. So they can be all of the same mentality, and they know God's way. And they are not in question, and they don't have a scripture that they're interpreting incorrectly. Christ, this ought to be a pretty neat course. I'd like to sit in on this one. <laughs> he will shepherd them. He will lead them to living fountains of waters. They're going to know. They're going to know what's right and wrong. So we see whether, whether it's those who go to the wilderness, whether it's those who go through the tribulation, all will come out with knowledge of God. And they will be the bride. They will be priests. They will be teachers in the millennium. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, where we started out, but I think it's a good place to end as well because it is the picture, the beautiful thing that God will create in all of his church. Let us be glad and rejoice. Yes, we should rejoice. It wasn't us that did this. It's God that did it. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Not just we made ourselves ready, God made us ready. God fixed us. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. How happy it will be to see that day.